welcome everyone and our special guest today is the official luthier of the Aspen Music Festival, Joan Balter. She's also the proprietor of Balter Violins in Berkeley since 1982. And she is also our um, always chief viola joke teller at Viola Mania, which I hope we will be able to have again and uh, we will all reunite there soon. So <laughs> without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Joan Balter. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. First of all, I didn't know until a few years ago that I was actually a luthier. A luthier is a masculine as a man and a luthier is a woman. So now I know it and now you do too. So, um, Let's start briefly, very briefly, because you don't need a history lesson, but why is the viola so different? Why is it so special? Because it's not standard. And um, the viola, like the violin family, evolved from the early uh, lyres and lutes starting way back in Europe in about the 11th century, and it gradually became the violin family as we know it around 1500 but the size of the viola um, was always variable whereas the size of the violin and the cello never was so um, the beauty of that is that it makes it more interesting for a luthier to figure out its mysteries because on a violin you know exactly that the mensur, the uh, the, the distance from the bridge notch to the edge and then the neck is always going to be 130 and 195 and the fingerboard's going to be exactly 270 millimeters. With the viola, there is no standard. But the beautiful thing is, is that it, it is the same proportion that violins have. And that proportion is two parts to three. So whatever your next stop is, that number should be in proportion to the mensur, which is the distance from here to here. Now your fingerboard doesn't have a specific length either, but it's gonna be five sixths of the string length. So the distance between your fingerboard and your bridge is going to be one sixth of your fingerboard length. And that means that your after length, which is the distance from the bridge to where the saddle is, should also be one sixth. So what does this all mean? It means that when everything is set up perfectly, you're going to have an interval when you pluck your D string. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> when you pluck your D string, and then you pluck behind your G string, that should be perfect. Everybody try that. Ah, you're all muted. I can't hear the cacophony. So, um, how many of you had the perfect octave? No. Okay. I did. Um, I Mine is off. Yeah, well, I can't see Good. all of you, but um, I presume that you heard that, right? You can hear that. So, yes. um, let's assume that you have a viola that was professionally made and professionally set up. I'm pretty sure that when you bought it, it would have been tuned to that pitch. So what happens is, and um, 
we all are guilty of having bridge straightening fear. Uh, every time you tune your viola from your A tuner, you're pulling the bridge backwards. Every time you tune from your DGC peg, you're pulling the bridge forward. So what happens after a while is you get a, a distortion. Your even though the feet have not moved, the top has. So, so now I'll just pluck. You hear that? It went flat. Why? Oh, my bridge is leaning forward. So in order to have everything vibrating as it was intended, I am going to straighten my bridge, which I'll show you how to do later. And now it's already in tune. What? What'd you say? I, I, um, anyway, so now it's back in tune because I straightened my bridge. So what you can do to see if your bridge is in the right place, if you have the right proportions, you can take a ruler and you can measure, you put it flush up against the nut and you see exactly where it joins the body at the edge. And you can do it either in millimeters or in inches, however, um, however it feels uh, easy for you. Uh, and mine is uh, 150 millimeters. And then um, theoretically, I would lay out a multiplication cross multiplication 2 over 3 is 150 over X and I'm not going to do the math now but that's where that stop should be again you can measure your fingerboard length and um, you know I have 304 so that should be five six and then you you can take your big ruler and get the whole length um, if you don't have a ruler big enough for that which most people don't unless they have a um, an expandable one you can do it with a tape measure and you want to just see how um, that proportion works out so um, one of the other things that we measure um, is the width between the F-hole lobes. Now sometimes you get a viola and it's not a great one, but it's what you have and it doesn't sound so great and you think, why? What's going on? And one of the things we notice sometimes is that the bridge, which on a violin is really pretty standard at 42 millimeters, viola bridges wear, vary in uh, width a lot. So um, we have um, 50 and 46, and basically the vibrations travel from the rosin bow to the string and the string excites the top of the bridge the bridge excites the top and then the vibrations are shooting up and down from the top now if the bridge feet overlap uh, the holes it kind of stifles the vibrations so what of course, I have a sophisticated uh, caliper, but I measure the different the distance between these holes, and then I make sure that my bridge is not as wide. Um, it needs to be just under. Now, if it's too much under, it won't cover your bass bar and your sound post, which I'll 
speak about next, but that's um, one thing that affects uh, your sound. And the other really important thing that affects it is uh, something called your projection. And projection is just a number where the where two rulers meet. If I drop my straight edge down, right down smack the very middle of my viola, where these two rulers converge, that number, it's just a number, it's not a ratio, it's called your projection. And mine is 30, which is absolutely normal. For violin, it's 26. 27 and a half for a viola it's 28 to 32 with 30 being absolutely normal cello 78 to 82 so what happens if your projection is low you will necessarily then have a lower bridge you'll have a lower angle of um, going across the bridge of the strings you'll have less tension you'll have less sound. Conversely, if the neck angle is set in too steeply, you're going to have a much taller bridge. It uh, is going to have an amazing amount of downward force, which will make ultimately a shrill sound, and it will warp or collapse because um, it, it's hard for it to be straight when it's so tall. It will also put undue pressure on the top, on the bass bar, and not a good idea. So neck projection is another thing that um, we look at when we're diagnosing instruments. And um, so it's good to know if you have a normal neck projection. One of the simple ways I can tell is if it's too low is I just sight down the fingerboard and if I can see the eyes in the heart of the bridge, I know that it's too low. I don't want to see those eyes. Consequently, you would have to have the neck raised, and that's that's a big deal. So uh, another important consideration is when the neck is set in, you have something called the overstand. And the overstand is the distance from the top of the instrument to the bottom of your fingerboard. And you can take your ruler and measure that overstand. And I'm getting five and a half. And on this side, I'm getting five. And what you want to make sure is that your overstand is a little bit higher on the C string than it is on the A string. And why is that? If your overstand is too low, uh, if it's turned around a little, unwittingly you can get tendonitis because when the neck is set in properly, you're bowing properly. Now just imagine the neck is set in a little bit that way. What happens? My elbow then is pulled in that way. Imagine doing that for hours a day, year after year you're going to get a pulling in your shoulder and a pulling in your elbow. But you're also going to have less mass on the C-string side of your bridge. So when you look down at your bridge, you'll notice you have uh, more vibrating mass between the lobe of your bridge on the C-side than you do on the A-side. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And if you don't see that, it's it's not really good. Um, so, Joan, when when you say lobe, are you talking about the big hole on the end? Yeah, yeah. So when you're um, just visualizing from here to the top, it's bigger on the C string. The dis the distance is bigger on the C string than it is on the A string. And if it's not, um, it doesn't have the capacity to have that fullness of sound on the C string and 
you have a possibility of getting tendonitis on your uh, in your elbow or your shoulder so uh, it's worth knowing about so these are the major proportions two parts to three five parts to six one part to six and one part to six now the other proportion that's inside that's really important is the relationship of your sound post to your bass bar now if you have a flexible ruler uh, be really careful you could put it in your f-hole and bump your sound post and look at a uh, hold it square and look at the number right at the f-hole notch where it bumps and I'm seeing 23 which is about average they depending on the size of the viola now the sound post is put in afterwards and theoretically when the bass bar is put in correctly this number when I bump here I'm bumping at 22 I will cut my sound post to be fit in the exact same corresponding place as my bass bar I can't see you all but how many of you were able to measure that successfully with a thin ruler you can't do that with a thick wooden one but my ruler um doesn't really start right at one it has a little extra on the end so that's not it very... doesn't matter what number it is it just see if it corresponds you, you want to have the correspondence of the bar when you bump it at the f hole notch to the sound post. They should bump at the exact same place. Gosh, I wish I could see all of you doing this. <laughs> If there's anything anybody doesn't understand, please ask me. This I have a question. This is Wendy. Um, so where the ruler should be is at the notch in the middle of the F-hole? Yeah. On both sides? Yes. I don't think mine's even. Well, that's why there are luthiers out there. <laughs> to... They're all closed now. Yeah, I know. I know. Nobody's been in my shop for almost a year. So, uh, since uh, Friday the 13th of March. That's how I remember. Yeah, Friday the 13th. So, one of the ways also we can influence our sound is with different lengths of tail pieces in relation to the tail gut. So sometimes people think you could get a little bit more tension, a little bit more brighter sound if you have a shorter tail piece with a longer tail gut. Some people think you can have the best sound in the world if you buy the lyre shaped um, fierce uh, viola tailpiece for several hundred dollars um, it's supposed to increase your Z force and I asked three prominent violin makers what Z force was and none of them could tell me so I figured it wasn't very important <laughs> and those who had experimented with this tailpiece hadn't noticed um, a, a great difference. So now we're going to talk about some of the things you can do yourself in terms of instrument care. And of course the most important thing is cleaning. Just keeping the dust off. Not polishing but cleaning. 
So um, having not had a client in my shop for almost a year, I've cleaned and polished and set up just about all my instruments. I do not have a dirty instrument in my shop to demonstrate with, but I can tell you that, um, well, rosin is a resin, it comes from trees. Rosin is a resin, it comes from trees. When they meet, they want to meld and get married into one another, and then it's very hard to get the rosin off. It's like plaque on your teeth, so uh, once it builds up, it's impossible to get off, um, and you have to have it done professionally. But uh, microfiber cloth, unlike a towel or a t-shirt, has um, millions of little barbs and will, will take off a lot more dirt and dust. So every time after you play, just stick your thumb under, under there and then just give a wipe. And just know that instruments don't like really to be touched. And if you are playing an orchestra and you're sitting like this, with your hand here, you're going to degrade the varnish over time. So when you're sitting, I would urge you just grab the neck um, and relax that way. Um, I use Viva paper towels, which are much softer than all the other brands. They're a little more expensive, but I reserve these for my instrument cleaning. And a little bit of spit will take off the hand dirt uh, that the cloth won't after a while. So I highly recommend um, where, where you see dirt on your instrument, uh, take a little spit and use it. It's much better than water. It has a little bit of acid, a little bit of enzyme, and great viscosity and non-toxic, and that's what they use to clean all the major paintings and sculptures. So whenever you see people standing on a ladder with a toothbrush scrubbing a uh, sculpture, they're using reconstituted spit. So Joan, can I ask a question? Sure. It's Christina. Hi. Do I need to have a um, necessarily have a paper towel or can I use this for the same purpose? Can you see? Oh, that. <laughs> Yes, but you could use that, but why would you want to mess that up? Because you, the, this, you're going to get so gross. And that, that you use every day and you wash once a month. This you use right. and you just throw out. Gotcha. My cloths are way too valuable for that. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> um, so um, the commercial polishes that you can buy are very bad for the instrument in the long run and very bad for you in the long run because they do have some petroleum distillates that are used to dissolve the dirt and then they have um, oil to make it look shiny. So you basically lose, loosen the dirt and then you smear it all around and shine it. But the danger is besides degrading fine varnish, it can get into micro cracks and it could get into if you have any loose purfling and if you have any old cracks and you get some uh, petroleum based uh, cleaner in there, it's going to be very difficult to glue that crack afterwards and it's going to be much more complicated and expensive to fix. So um, no cheap polishes, please. Um, uh, a French polish is something that used to be done in shops a whole lot. And basically a French polish is where you first cleaned the instrument thoroughly. So you had um, a totally clean, smooth surface. But a French polish was really alcohol with a drop of oil on it as a mover. And you essentially um, dissolved the very, very top layer of varnish and reamalgamated it without adding anything theoretically or removing anything. And now it's thought that we don't even want to do that to the older instruments. And so if your instrument is really dull, uh, we'll use a wax-based polish that has no oil in it. But I, I don't recommend really that you do that yourself. And 
once you have a clean, polished surface, it it's so much easier to maintain. So um, I urge you to take pride in your violas. So there you go, cleaning. Now, if can I ask a question, Joan? Sure. Don't eat, don't ask me if you need to ask permission. It just uh, I well I, I, even though I'm a violinist, can I ask? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a very snooty friend who told me he was appalled at how I cleaned my violin. And he said to me that the part of the cloth from the makers, like I have your cloth or violin fushi or whatever, that the top, <laughs> that the top with the, with the writing, you should use on the strings and then the other side for the instrument and you should never mix. And absolutely never, one side was for the strings and one side for, for the instrument. So is, is that true? Well, I, you know, if you want to be neurotic about it, you could just use it for everything and then throw it in the wash once a month. You know, yeah. cloths are big enough and hold enough uh, rosin and dirt, you know. But yeah, some people want to use a, a separate cloth, but it, it, you don't want to get too neurotic. Now, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Strings are very expensive, highly engineered. <clears throat> and they break down from the inside to the outside. They break down from three things, microscopic uh, particulate matter of dead skin cells, from perspiration and um, from rosin getting in there. So once it gets in there, you can't really clean it. You, you just see rosin sitting on top and under the string and you think, oh, I'll just give it a wipe. But your strings start to degrade right away. So I always recommend um, wiping them. But when do you use alcohol? Um, the basic answer is you really never want to use alcohol. But if you've been bad and it got built up, it's really the only way to get it off. So, um, you know, you used to go to the doctor and swipe these little alcohol wipes. Um, now we don't go to the doctor anymore. But um, in the shop, we don't use 70% alcohol. These, um, most drugstore alcohol is 70%. And um, most of that is water, 29.9%. We use in the shop, um, oops, sorry. Um, what do I do with that? Um, um, we buy 99% alcohol and it, it dries much faster because when you put 70% alcohol on your strings, the the alcohol evaporates really quickly, but the moisture gets in there. So you want to do it really, really fast. You know, worst case scenario, you use this. Best case, if you're going to have alcohol, you buy some, uh, you know, a pint of 91 at the drugstore and it'll last you for the rest of your life. Um, when you're cleaning with alcohol, um, you never keep the cloth. Uh, anywhere near the instrument. You take your alcohol, you go away from the instrument, you make sure that your cloth isn't gonna drip at all, and then you do it really, really fast. And you can pinch the string, get under there, and then when you're done with that, just wipe your chin rest, get that schmutz and makeup off um, and uh, chin rest cleaning is something you can do with alcohol but um, if you keep your strings clean you don't really need to um, now people ask me how often do you change your strings and what kind of strings do you use you change your strings when you feel like they're not giving you the sound that you want anymore when you know that they once did. So the manufacturer recommends like every 200 hours of play or something. 
but some strings last longer, some strings last a shorter period of time. Um, people say, what brand should I use? What brand is the best? Well, it's what sounds the best on your instrument, and there is no one answer, but we have two main competitors in the string business. We have um, the Parastro Company, and um, we have uh, the manufacturers of from the dominant family. That's the Tomastic Strings. And unfortunately, they make like 20 different kinds of strings now. And if you read their descriptions, they all sound terrific. And if you read the Parastra, they all sound terrific. And they'll each give you the tension of each string and each set and the, the combined string tension for the set. But what they won't do is they won't compare their string to the other brand's string. So if you were to ask Perastro how their Ava Parazzi Gold compares to the Peter Infeld for Viola, which are both considered the premium brands, they won't be able to tell you. So what is the difference between them? Um, not that much, except that Tomastic strings tend to last a little bit longer because there's a proprietary interwinding layer of something that is a barrier to these three evil things I described, the dead skin cells, the rosin, and the perspiration. So, you know, um, Eva Parazzi is um, a terrific set. The Eva Parazzi Gold is also terrific, and it's the only set where I recommend all four uh, strings because they blend. With the um, Tomastic strings, if you have uh, the PI or the Dominant, or the um, they also make the Tungsten C string with the Silver G string, um, they uh, tend to to last a little bit longer, but you also want to put on a different A. For some reason, in all my years, I've never met a professional violist who used um, an A that matched. So most people use the Yargar or the Larson A. And um, uh, there's no advantage of one over the other except how your instrument responds to it. So if you have an instrument you love and you're and you want even more where do you start you start with my setup my setup is my sound post my bridge my strings my tail piece tuning and my fingerboard planing now how is a sound post selected for an instrument when a maker makes an instrument, they look at the grain and they think, oh, I'm going to choose a post with grain that's similar to that of the top. And so that's the standard place. But if your viola is a little bit brash, you might want to have first a post adjustment and then second, maybe a different sound post. So how are sound posts adjusted for sound? Theoretically, the sound post sits behind the bridge foot about half the width of itself um, back from the foot and in at a place to match, to correspond with the bass bar. So let's say it's too bright. If the sound post is too bright, you would push it in away from the edge towards the C string. That would take some of the edge off the A string and open up the C. If it's too dark, if you're not cutting through on your solos on the A string, you pull it towards the A string. Now, so that's for balance. Then in terms of power, the spot that I just described theoretically is the best spot. If it's maybe too loud or something you want to you could 
back away from the bridge so that it takes a little bit longer for the vibrations from the bridge to get to the bridge, to through to the sound post. If you want a quick, fast, loud response, you move it towards the bridge until it gets too close and it chokes. And then you back away and you find that perfect place for balance. So we don't go whacking around in circles. We're either adjusting away from the C string, towards the A string, towards the tailpiece, or towards the bridge. Um, so we have only four possibilities. It's not just a circle. And I want to show you some sound posts. Um, it's so much easier to see on a cello one because they're bigger. But uh, yeah. Okay. So can you see that the darker sound post uh, has very few grains and the light sound post has a gazillion grains. So when you have, let's say, a French instrument that's brash, you think, okay, I'm going to put in a sound post with fewer grains. So if your instrument isn't bright enough, you say, oh, I'm going to find an old sound post with really tight grains, and let's see if that works. The other thing is, if you're feeling experimental, uh, you have hardnesses of bridges. So when I select a bridge for a viola, I listen to it. Did you hear the difference? Low pitch, dull. High pitch. They have different pitches, but I'm also hearing different responses. So I can pick a bridge that I think could work for your instrument. The problem for you is that all of this experimentation is very, very, very expensive. So a um, set of strings can easily be $130. A bridge could easily be up to $300. Um, fingerboard planing, $150. New tailpiece and gut set up and adjusted, um, $50 or $60. So, you know, you're, you're spending some money. So um, I wanted to show you how to straighten your bridge because um, we know that bridges want to move and in order for your instrument to sound great and for you to play in tune, when you get that twist that I talked about with where the A comes back and these three pull forward, you have your fingers compensating when you're trying to play fifth. So instead of barring straight across, your finger has to compensate, and then when you straighten your bridge, you have to relearn how to play in tune again. So straightening your bridge, it's a little bit scary at first, but you get used to it, and you just have to overcome your fear. And the worst thing you can do is to loosen the strings, because then you're going to pull them forward again. So what I recommend you do is take a business card and just cut it off and just mark the corner so you know which is your square edge. And then what I do is I put it on the belly behind the bridge and you can see I have a right angle. And basically a bridge is built like the human body with a flat back and an arched chest. If you were to have it absolutely flat though and you apply pressure it'll collapse easily. If you have a little bit of an arch, it'll have much more strength. And that's why bridges um, have arches. So slightly, just above where the heart is, it rolls forward. Because if you pl apply downward pressure on something with an absolutely flat back, it'll collapse. So you want to make sure that the bridge is 
absolutely parallel to the nut. That's actually the way you get um, perfect fifths. But since the nut is too far away to visualize, you can visualize the end of the fingerboard, which is always pretty much parallel um, to the nut. So you want to create a visual parallel between your bridge and the end of the fingerboard. And uh, I put it between my legs. I see people go like this and pinch and twist, but you have no control. And this is when bridges flip out, and that's when you gouge a hole under the tailpiece or have the bridge break. So I just recommend you hold it between your legs, you anchor your elbows, you anchor your wrists, you take three fingers underneath and you hold it and then I'm using two fingers on top to pull it back. But I don't do it unless I feel like I'm squeezing it really, really, really hard and I'm just pulling back on the top. And the way you can um, make sure it doesn't get stuck is every time you change your strings, you take your Northern California Viola Society pencil and you lubricate that groove because when rosin gets stuck in that string, the string can't slide through so the bridge won't move easily. Also, lubricate your nut when you change your strings. Um, oh, one thing I always recommend, if your string starts unraveling at the bridge or at the nut, worst thing you could do is buy another one and put it on because the reason it unraveled hasn't changed. Um, it's being ripped um, by the wood, which has gotten a little bit rough. So that's when you need to go to a violin shop unless you're willing to invest in a tiny, tiny little mouse tail or rat tail file this is actually not from the hardware store, but it's from a violin supply company. But if you just, um, just you know, run it through there and polish that edge, take off uh, the roughness, and then lube it, um, you can fix the problem. But um, if you see that you're consistently wrecking your strings at the nut or at the bridge, do get the issue fixed. Don't just put on a new string. Um, okay, lubricating pegs. I want to ask a question. Um, I had to adjust a student's cello bridge recently, and I could not hold it in my lap the way I would normally do on a violin or viola. How do you do it with a cello to adjust the bridge? Um, Sorry, no, we're like Patina. We're not supposed to be talking about other instruments, but okay. um, I I put it on my lap. I put the scroll down. I hold the bottom, and I I do it the same way. I ha but I have my elbows anchored on the body, and I have three fingers underneath, and uh, I have my thumb and forefinger pinching, and I. Pull it back, and it's it just requires courage. And um, I urge you, the next time you go see your luthier, to ask her um, to watch you do it, to just demonstrate to watch you do it. So try it in the company of a professional first, if you don't feel confident um, doing it, because it's it's not hard. And once you do it, um, it's something you should be doing every few days. It's It should just become part of your normal habits. You rosin your bow, you know, check your bridge, whatever. It, it's just part of life. Thank you. Sure. So pegs, we have three products. We have... Um, peg 
dope, uh, which looks like that. We have peg compound, which looks like that. And then we have peg drops. And for you music teachers out there, peg drops are the fastest way and most um, expedient way to deal with multiple peg problems at once with kids so you don't have to take the string out of the peg. Uh, you just basically loosen the peg, pull it out a little bit, and dribble some on there. And it takes a few minutes to harden up, and then um, that's all there is to it. But let's say your pegs are slipping. Your pegs are slipping you use the peg compound. Uh, a couple of times a year you get norm normal seasonal peg slipping or getting too tight and that's just a result of climate change. But if, if you really are unraveling, if your peg just goes blinga blinga often, it may not fit that well. You can tell if your peg fits by looking for two shiny rings where they make contact with the peg box. And if you only see one ring or you don't see the shininess all the way around, then your pegs just don't fit. And then you may need to have your peg either adjusted or new pegs. So I put that compound only on the area where the peg makes contact with the wall. I don't just arbitrarily um, rub it on. So I do that once and then I take it out and I do it again only on that spot and then the peg should hold nicely. Now if my pegs are uh, too tight, you hear them go eh, 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 eh. that's when you use peg dope. And again, it's the same thing. And you just put it on the area where it's shiny. You smush it in. And then you do it again. And you smush it in. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, peg placement um, for easy tuning. And this once you figure out how to do it, it's going to change your life and make you so happy. So, so um, the part of our brain that controls our motor, fine motor skills, is also right near the part of the brain that controls our mouth. So. When our pegs don't fit comfortably in our hands, see, I want my peg, when I go out on stage, I want my peg to fall right there. These two pegs should be parallel to each other, and they should be right where they fall into your hand. So if you go out on stage and your peg, let's say, is in this horizontal position, look at my face. And you can't help it. So... Um, because it's connected. So what you want to do when you change your peg, you, you don't know where it's going to fall and there's no rule of if you put the peg, uh, put the string through a half an inch or a quarter an inch that it's going to be right because every string length is different and every peg diameter is different. So you string the peg and then what happens is let's say your hand falls in this most uncomfortable position it me and you want it to fall here that means oh it, i need to pull the string through a little more but you don't want to take the peg off you don't want to take the string off and this is why i urge every one of you to have a set of tweezers that's no longer good enough for tiny little hairs um, Keep your tweezers in your viola case, and then when you want to change your string, what I do, I 
pulled the peg out, I loosened the, the string one turn, I put in the tweezers and I just pulled the string through a little more and then I tightened it up again. And so you do that, it's not rocket science. You do it a few times, it's either going to be more string or less string that you need. But for our purposes, it's easier to pull it through uh, towards you a little more. So you just loosen it, pull the end of the string towards you, and then tighten it. And ultimately, you'll get it figured out so that these two string, these two pegs will, um, will be parallel. And if you look at fine violin photography, like on Strad magazine covers and stuff, you'll notice they always have the pegs beautifully arranged. Um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm would like to ask a question about that too. Yeah, sure. Um, my sense of doing that is like every time you detune the peg a little bit and make some adjustment like that, it's reducing the life of that string. Is that in, an incorrect feel, um, belief? No, that's correct. That's why you don't want to um, put on new strings and then ask a maker to get a new bridge and then go back the next week and decide, oh, I wanted to get my fingerboard plain. So yes, when you take a string off and let it sit, um, it it breaks down. Strings um, don't like to be tuned more than a half a step above their pitch because it stretches the metal, you change the molecular structure. So you really want to treat the strings gently, but when you're just putting it on for the very first time, it doesn't take that long, and even though you're detuning it, it it's just a matter of a few minutes, and it's it's not um, it, it's not going to be that detrimental. So okay, thank you. I misunderstood. I thought you were suggesting that. I, now I understand. You mean to do that just when you put on a string for the first time to get the peg in the right place? Yes, and remember they will stretch, so you want them to be a little bit a little bit more in, eh, so that eventually they'll be you know, a little bit more that way. So, cause they are going to go flat. So you just have to overcompensate a little, but if you do that, um, it, it'll just really change your life. I have um, a question about strings too, if I could. Sure. I use Perastro Eudoxa. Do you have, I wonder why you didn't mention. I don't mention Eudoxa because nobody, um, uses gut strings, uh, regularly who are professionals because they have a gut core and they're not as stable and you know gut has been essentially replaced with a purlon or a nylon core and um, they're too elegant for and they're lovely strings but they're not as um, loud and they're not as uh, resilient when you go to a damp climate or a super dry climate, they dry out or they, they stretch, they, you have to tune them constantly. And, and That's you know, true. It, yeah, <laughs> and people don't want that anymore. Oh, mixing string brands. Um, the short answer is not a great idea, except for the A string. Uh, unless it's in the same string family with the same tension because uh, they have different responses. A string from one brand might have a quicker response. Uh, it, it, it'll like, you can get into the string easier on this brand than on that brand. And if you're doing, um, playing a lot of fast music or um, just, just playing regularly, you'll notice that uh, if you're very sensitive, that there's a different response and it doesn't really work well. So uh, I recommend you use three bottom strings of the same the same brand, and uh, the A string can be different. Yeah. Now, 
the other thing I recommend owning is something called screw eyelet and e-tuner lubricant, but it could be a tuner. So basically it looks like um, your chapstick and I have um, once made the mistake of trying to put it on, but um, once a month or so you want to take out your A tuner and just run it through there and that's because you have your perspiration getting into the metal, you have metal rubbing on metal, you have wear, you have rust and then it gets stiff and it breaks. Same thing, grab your frog, unscrew your bow, run your screw through the lube and then I just lube the butt a little bit so that it keeps it from deteriorating. So, can, can um, you repeat the name of that again? Well, it's called, well, this Rodney Moore, he's a bow maker. It's called Screw Eyelet and E Tuner Lubricant. Um, so, and if you don't want to invest in that, one of those will surely last you a lifetime. But if you don't want to invest in that, there's a little piece of old candle that everyone has lying around. It's not quite as effective, but it is effective. So you can just use candle. Um, okay, rosin. What kind of rosin? So we spend $35. So we spend $70 now on a rosin on the bespoke Australian rosin with the leather thing that's either crisp or supple. Um, it's all bullshit. Um, it's all marketing and basically rosin is harvested uh, just one or two months a year uh, from the tree sap and it's the additives that are put in that make it different from another brand. But the idea that a rosin could cost, you know, uh, seventy dollars. It, it's just um, there's no reason for it. So basically, um, you know, you, you don't walk up to a tree and see that it says, "Oh, viola solo tree," because you know Andrea makes a viola solo rosin as opposed to viola orchestral rosin, as opposed to a cello solo, cello orchestra, violin, whatever. Um, basically, it's what they put in it um, and it's a drop of this or a drop of that and there's light rosin and dark rosin and the cheap rosins have a drop of dark stuff put into it because they think dark rosin is prettier but basically a darker rosin when you get real rosin an expensive more expensive rosin dark rosin is a little bit softer creates a little less dust and is good in a um, drier climate. Um, in a wet climate, you want a drier rosin, but it doesn't matter that much. There's all-purpose rosins and people have used them for centuries. And there are you know, a couple of basic brands that have been around forever, like Bernadelle rosin is probably what Paganini used years ago. And they make it in a light version and a dark version. Um, Salco makes a rosin in New York that a lot of people use in their rosins. And it, the beauty of that rosin is that it doesn't have any additives, so it, it can blend well with other rosins. So you, you really... Um, don't need to listen to the advertising because like Perastro makes a a rosin, a Eudoxa rosin, which is supposed to blend with Eudoxa strings. And Dominant makes a Dominant rosin, which you use on Dominant strings. You know, don't believe it. But just know that there are differences and they don't always mix well. So if, try to remember your own rosin. You don't want to borrow your friend's rosins all the time when you're 
at rehearsals, but um, um, but you don't need to spend more than ten dollars on a rosin. It's uh, not going to change your playing, but they do go bad. They oxidize, so don't leave them out exposed and change them every two years or so. Um, okay. Um, now we are going to go to questions because we, I talk a lot, but we got 10 minutes or, or you want to see how, uh, what's inside a bow. Can I ask a couple of quick cleaning questions? Sure. Um, rice, do you use that? Do you recommend that? How do you do that? If you recommend it. And the other one is like, how do you get watermarks? off the top of your instrument. Okay, uh, the first rice for cleaning the inside, we use it all the time. We just take a few teaspoons of the cheapest white rice. We put it in, we hold the instrument really, really firmly, and we just shake it every which way. And then we go outside to feed the birds, and then you flip it over, and you just shake it every which way, and that loosens all the dust bunnies and all the dirt inside and you shake it out it it's absolutely fine to do that and that's what we do when uh, we do a thorough cleaning and polish we we do the rice um, your next question was watermarks watermarks Water. um, the only way to deal with watermarks is um, with alcohol and you don't know how to do it and don't do it but often watermarks uh, the water can be drawn out with the alcohol in a cloth with the oil and you know um, it, it can be done um, and it should be done sooner rather than later but um, yes watermarks are removable but so like that would be a French polish then Yes. Okay. Yeah, the traditional with, with the alcohol that pulls the moisture out. Yeah. Well, it's not really water. It's spit and drool and sweat. And well, <laughs> spit and drool should come <laughs> off with more spit and drool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, more questions? I, ha I have one. Um, so when you're talking about getting an adjustment, it is a matter of making all these measurements and then trying out different placements of, of the sound post. Well, if you come in to me and you say, I'm not sounding so good, I need an adjustment. If you're a professional player, I assume that your instrument is proportional that everything is fine, I look at it, it just looks fine, then I'll just give you a sound post adjustment. But if I don't know you or your instrument and you're having major problems, I will say, um, would you like me to um, check over your whole instrument at, for proportion and structure and see uh, if there's something beyond just the sound post? Because sometimes, can't get anywhere with a sound post. There are other problems. Um, and, you know, if the strings are really old, there's no use in giving you a sound post adjustment. First, change your strings, and then we can have a sound post adjustment. If I see your fingerboard is really rippled, it sounds muddy and clumsy. So, Katie? Hmm? I, I see you, not me, and I hear you cleaning. Right. Oh, that's because you got it on the speaker view thing. Oh, no, I, I just disappeared. I, I disappeared and you came back. I, I didn't touch anything. So, okay, so we have a few minutes, and I've been asked to show you what's inside your bow. So don't try this at home. Um, we're going to do a simple 
um, bow demonstration. Uh, now the only thing standard about a bow, viola bow, is the weight. Just like the violin bow averages 60, viola bow averages 70, cello bow averages 80. So no matter what the size of your viola, your viola bow uh, will be the same. Um, although some people with really big violas like to have a little more heft to their bows and they go up to 73 or 74. Okay, so this is your tip and in your tip is this wedge and I am going to take it out and you can see that a well fit wedge is put in with no glue, pops out cleanly, and what's inside here is called the mortise, and the mortise is just this squared off aperture that holds the wedge. So a bow never should have the hair glued in. And very bad student bows and very bad rehairers who can't fit a wedge put in piles of glue. It's the worst thing in the world. Okay, this is the stick. This is the butt of the bow. This is the screw, and this is the screw button. So, this is my gross anatomy class. From constant screwing, this butthole gets worn out, and the nipple gets worn down, um, and can actually crack. So, um, you want to make sure that your screw doesn't have too much free play, uh, either with no frog attached or with the frog attached. It, the way that it's going to stay healthy is if it goes in absolutely perpendicular to the eyelet and there's no wobble, which is really good. Um, if you keep stripping your eyelets, it means that your butthole is worn and needs to be bushed. Okay, so this is your frog. This is your ferrule, which is from the French fer, iron. It's uh, a metal band that joins two dissimilar substances. So we have ferrules in daily life everywhere you look. Like this is my chisel. It has a ferrule that joins the blade to the handle. And we all have pencils every day, and that's the ferrule that joins the eraser to the wood. Okay, so I have just pried out what's called a spread wedge. And then this is called the slide because it slides right out. And then here we have another mortise and another wedge. And again, we have a well-fit wedge that just pops out neatly and a nice knot on the hair. And here we have a nice mortise. And that's all that's inside a bow. There should be no weight, no gobs of glue, and no wax or added material, just a nice clean mortise. So that's all there is to it. Okay, now you know everything. More questions? Or is it martini time? So, so I was uh, um, working on slobbering all over the top of my instrument. Uh -huh. You made me feel guilty about how grubby it was. <laughs> And um, the reason I was unmuted is I wanted to ask that there's there's one spot under the C string that there's just this big glop. Everything else is cleaning up nicely, but there's this one big glop. Should I just keep spitting on it? And what do you um, uh, what do you think that glop is made of? Rosin, dirt, 
pollution, pollen. One thing that we do um, in shops, it's called spit rolling. And um, we, we often get globs of dirt in the purpling groove. We spit and then we just build up some heat. And even though this instrument is pretty clean, I'm rolling off a little bit of dirt. So try that. Just use the flat of your middle finger and uh, just everyone does that right near their purfling. Just get a lot of pressure. Yeah, you'll be getting dirt rolls. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Um, yes, you can do that on your spot and um, <laughs> when it requires patience. It'll take about 15 minutes uh, oh. to get one, one little spot. You know, sometimes on a great instrument, I can spend three or four hours cleaning it. Um, uh, can, can I uh, double check um, when uh, we try to straighten the bridge? Yes. Uh, it has a slight leaning, right? Uh, which way? Uh, am I correct that it's no well it has it's an optical illusion if you look at it from the a string side it always looks like it's leaning back so you always want to look from the c string side and that's when you see the right angle and that's correct but it's not leaning it's it's absolutely flat just about to the heart and then a tiny rollover at the top that's almost negligible but if you cut off this business card and put it in there you uh -huh. can see that it's you have the right angle from the top just almost to to the very top of the bridge so, I see. but the the chest is angled backwards just like your chest you have a, a full chest Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit confusing because it makes me think that it, there is a little leaning back. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it always looks that way from the A string side, but not it's the just side. the way it looks. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. Okay. That's the scariest part. That is absolutely the scariest part. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what do tuners do to the after length? Tuners shorten the after length and are not recommended. They're kind of like um, training wheels on your bike. One, once you learn how to use pegs, use them. And if you have crappy pegs um, and a good viola and you want to sound great, get new pegs. Don't use, don't use the um, plastic tuners. Mm -hmm. I mean, the plastic tailpieces with the built-in tuners. It's better just to have a wooden tailpiece and to have working pegs. So invest the money and get good working pegs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you always recommend uh, the fingerboard be planed or only if you see any uh, indentations? Only if, it's, only if it's rippled. You can, um, you can tell when you pluck, um, if you go up by half steps, you know, uh, you can tell if the fingerboard is rippled and then tight down there and you can, you can see, but a fingerboard should be absolutely flat with a little bit of a curvature to it. But when it gets rippled from practice, it looks, I'm exaggerating, it looks like this. And if you're on top of a lump and there's a groove in front of you, you'll get a nice clear sound. But if your finger's in the groove and there's a little lump in front of it, then you get this fuzzy uh, sound. And that's when you know you need to have your fingerboard plane. So. Okay, I've never had my fingerboard planed uh, at all and never seen the need of it. But I know that um, uh, other people have recommended, oh, you've got to do it. So well, if you sight down, close one eye, sight down your fingerboard and see if it's smooth and shiny or see if you see the ocean waves rippling. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, some fingerboards are a little different, like they have an angle kind of a... Yes, they're, it's called, some people call it a, a can't, um, um, as opposed to don't. Uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> so, 
uh, it's much like the cellos have that angled C string, and that is because the C string has a wider vibration, and by going flat at that angle, it yeah. allows the C string to vibrate louder without slapping against the uh, fingerboard. Oh, okay. Joan, will you still be my friend if I straighten my bridge on my cello in the position that I play because I feel more stable with my thumbs. I'll always be your friend. Oh, thank you. But you still think I should do it upside down? Well, you know, we, we learn best practices and we tend to do it that way. And it, it works for us. And that's what people have been doing um, for hundreds of years. If, if there's a better way, I'd be interested in knowing it, but it, I can't imagine that technically it could be better and less dangerous for the instrument. But I usually do that more on um, student instruments. Yeah. I don't do it really on my own. Yeah. Oh, I see some comments, but I can't read them because they're tiny. But my brother-in-law, oh, my God. Hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much joan i i'm not seeing a bunch of questions but if there are uh type them in the chat but um thank you so much this was absolutely wonderful and very informative my pleasure and um if you if anybody has any questions they could email me at uh joan balter at sbcglobal.net <laughs>